Hello everyone, hope you're doing okay today. This is uh, your world history teacher, Ben Osborne, talking to you a little bit about Unit 2.4 to 2.7, um, which is reasonably interesting. This one is mostly going to be about the Trans-Saharan trade, but then again, as always, with the um, College Board material, 2.5, 2.6, 2.7 is kind of a remix, in a sense, of some of the similar information. So I usually try to include a lot of that on the earlier stuff, uh, but you know, still. So we'll be going over a couple things a little bit more here just in a different context. So again, Trans-Saharan Trade Network is our big one that we are looking at here. Um, and let's start off with a little map for us. So this is Western Africa is where the, trade, the Trans-Saharan Trade Network is. Again, there is trade going across parts of the Sahara in Eastern Africa as well, but um, that's mostly connected in with this. And the majority of this is really traveling through that Western African area because Eastern Sahara doesn't have as much, not as many people living there, stuff like that. Um, so over there on the left, you're going to see a colored outline, basically. That is the Mali Empire, which is the largest empire in this area at this time period. It previously was a place called Ghana. You can see Ghana over there on the map. Um, that previous example from about 900 to about 1200 or so, that was a different ethnic group in a sense that was sort of in charge of this area. What we see in this area then is like certain cities are going to rise and fall, certain like peoples will rise and fall um, over time. Um, and so at this time period then, the, the group of people um, led by this, uh, some of the most important cities here are going to be called the Mali Empire. Later on we'll talk about Songhai as well. So as you can see from this trade network then, they're going to be trading in some pretty specific things here. Okay, so gold is one. They have large amounts of gold in this area. They're also going to be trading things like ivory, which is uh, for, you know, with like a horse, uh, sorry, horses, which is elephants. There's no horse ivory, which is elephants, uh, coming from elephants. Also some other things, copper beads, uh, glass, you know, stuff like that. And also, unfortunately, enslaved peoples also. This is before the Trans-Saharan, sorry, Trans-Atlantic trade network. So most of these slaves are going towards the Middle East. They would typically be sort of like house slaves or concubines. They don't tend to do as much uh, work in the um, in like fields and things because there's not really fields there. Um, lastly, one thing that's important here is salt as well. So salt is uh, vital in this period for food preservation. You're going to salt your meats or salt some vegetables to keep them from uh, decaying and in the process therefore you can keep it for a much longer period. So pretty important for people in this period to make sure that they have enough food to eat. So that's some of the reasons why it is so important. All right, as uh, states grow, they're going to encourage trade, and as trade grows, it encourages states. This is, has a bit of a feedback loop, right? So you have a small settlement, people start trading there. Uh, that trade then convinces more people to move to that settlement. Once more people have moved to that settlement, then they are going to uh, demand more trade. And so, therefore, you know, just kind of builds and builds and builds on itself. As we've talked about before, camels and camel saddles are going to help expand the trade in this area. Um, spread of Islam, or in other places like Buddhism, so religion in general, but in this particular place, Trans-Saharan trade, Islam will help unite the area, make trade easier, because they have a common culture or similar culture. Uh, many of them will speak Arabic, um, things like that. And then lastly, caravans and more travelers will spread technology and culture. So the more travelers we have, the more cultural uh, transport that we'll have going on as well. Got a little camel right up here above me. They look cute. They're really mean. All right, let's check this out then. This is the Mali Empire, again, in a different uh, kind of frame for our map here. Um, you can see the uh, major trade routes that they got going on. You can see some of the most important of the cities, Timbuktu, uh, Kumbisele, uh, Gao, uh, Jen, uh, down there in the, in the south, kind of hard to see there. Um, but also within that area then, you're going to see things like the gold fields. Uh, there's the, what is that, Bure and uh, Bambuk gold fields. Um, also, this very important river, the Niger River, that's going to run through this area. One thing to note again, um, the sort of fuzzy boundaries, part of that has to do with the nature of African kingship. Uh, again, more kinship-based systems about families and peoples than it was about like just specific territory, which is a more European kind of thing. But those are the, that is the general area under the control of the Malian king. All right, so Mali will take over after Ghana, as we mentioned before. Um, this is a period when we're going to see a lot more uh, centralization, which includes cities for learning. So more cities, more trading, more learning is going on here. 
The most famous person from this era is Mansa Musa. Mansa is a title. It's like king, kind of. Um, so he is King Musa. He is the grandnephew of the founder of the Malian dynasty, whose name is Sundiata, often called the Lion King. Um, so Musa has an interesting story. Supposedly the person before him left on a trip. Uh, they were going to go sail across the Atlantic Ocean, but they never came back. So he was appointed the Mansa in return for that. Um, he and, you know, Mali in general, but specifically the leader of Mali, um, had so much money. Um, it is estimated that he was probably the richest human being to ever live. Um, has so much money, it just doesn't really mean anything to him anymore. Like, what do you buy with that much money? So he typically tended to use it for things like uh, building schools and benefits for his people, actually. Um, one of the examples of this that we famously hear about is his Hajj to Mecca, which supposedly disrupted economies along the way. So, like, he arrives in Cairo, he's purchasing bread and food for his um, entourage that is coming with him. And in the process of spending all this money, it increases the price of bread because there's a limited amount of bread. So, they're going to have to, you know, they're going to have to uh, raise the prices for it. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's kind of wild. He basically caused inflation within uh, the city of Cairo and other places along the way. Um, Mali is the beneficiary of this in-depth trade. So again, as we talked about gold, salt, forest products like ebony or ivory, these are things that are going to be coming out of the Trans-Saharan trade. This is from the Catalan Atlas. It's one of our oldest, best atlases uh, made in, I believe it was made in Europe. Um, but one of the cool things about it is that it has these pictures of various rulers that were around around the time period it was made. It was made about 1325, so this would have been when Mansa Musa was still around. So this is a picture of Mansa Musa. Um, he has a gold orb that he is pondering, uh, as well as a gold, um, gold uh, crown. Um, so just kind of showing that off. It's kind of cool to see in the Catalan Atlas too, like the little cities everywhere. Uh, those cities have uh, onion domes if they are Islamic, and they have uh, crosses if they're Christian and so forth. So this, again, is some things we've talked about before, but just to kind of reiterate it here near the end, cultural consequences of trade. Um, and get, again, in general, uh, spread of culture led to changes, right? I mean, that doesn't make a lot of, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. Like as cultures go to new places, that causes change in those places. If you have new types of religion, some people will adopt that religion, etc. A couple of examples in this period then, religious spread reinforced the rule of certain groups. So for example, in Trans-Saharan Africa, the uh, spread of Islam meant that the local uh, kings would call upon Islam as a way to maintain their authority, right? Like, I am Allah's chosen, or I am following Islam properly, therefore you should listen to me, things like that. Um, it tended to consolidate power, um, though it did also lead to some fusion. So because, for example, the Trans-Saharan area was so far away from um, you know, Mecca, they kind of changed things just a little bit. They had some things that were influenced by local, um, by local African practices as well. Uh, Buddhism, as we talked about before in China, um, led to Neo-Confucianism. Uh, we also have examples like Buddhist sects like Zen that are created due to contact with Taoism. Um, Hinduism will spread in Southeast Asia due to trade. I'll show you some, an image of that in a second. Um, temples have Buddhist influences though because this kind of combination. Spread of technology will also, of course, increase that trade. We've talked about Latin sales probably far, far too much. Here on the left, then, that is going to be Angkor Wat. Okay, that is a city. Uh, if you look sort of right above me here, you'll see Cambodia. See, my finger disappears. Ooh, oh, just below it. That's Cambodia, modern-day Cambodia. Um, and then right above my finger there is Angkor, the city of Angkor, which is where Angkor Wat is. That, uh, what is that, purpley pink, whatever that is. Please don't make fun of me, colorblind. Uh, it says Khmer Empire there. That is a major empire, a land-based empire in Southeast Asia. We talked about Srivijaya and Majapahit. This was their sort of land-based uh, cousin, in a sense. Um, so one of the things about this kingdom that's kind of unusual is that Hinduism spreads here. It does not last forever, like it's not Hindu in this area anymore. Um, but in the process, uh, this Buddhist area uh, adopted Hinduism, and so they start building temples, like this beautiful temple here. But um, some elements of it are more Buddhist in structure. So for example, the kind of tall kind of things there in the middle, it is it looks similar to a Buddhist stupa. Um, so that's kind of an example of the combination kind of thing that we're talking about. Little bits of change between different groups. 
We also do have some environmental consequences of trade. Uh, expansion of trade is going to lead to environmental damage. Uh, you know, that just has to do with more people being in a specific location. So Zimbabwe, for example, with Great Zimbabwe, um, that's going to decline in this period because of overgrazing. Uh, people lived there, more trade came there, more people came there, and the areas they had for grazing their animals started to shrink uh, gradually. Uh, and so what happens then is that there's a big collapse uh, because of the lack of space for grazing of animals. We also have in Europe um, deforestation of fuel as well as, for fuel, excuse me, as well as soil erosion will cause damage. So the only real way that you could cook your food or heat your water or whatever in the medieval period is using, you know, wood, right? Um, they will not discover the uses of coal. I mean, they knew what coal was, but as far as like wide scale use of coal is not until the uh, probably 18th, 19th century. Um, so in the meantime, then people are just chopping down trees and they're also, when they're chopping them down, they're often growing crops. Um, so that is going to lead to a massive amount of soil erosion and cause problems. Again, we talked about the little ice age before when we talked about Europe. Um, that's going to change a lot of weather, weather patterns. And of course, connectivity, as we talked about before, uh, will spread this disease. Things like bubonic plague, black death. We all know about that recently as a result of the uh, COVID pandemic. One thing I want you to remember when it comes to environmental consequences, I don't want you to just think of like pollution. You know, we think like pollution and damage to the environment. That is certainly a part of environmental consequences, but it could also be things like um, new uh, new crops, right? So like here we have a map that shows bananas are traveling over to parts of Africa. That's not like necessarily causing damage, though, you know, monocropping can do that. Um, it's also, though, changing the local area. The environment is changing. People are starting to have banana farms and things instead of uh, other other things uh, that they could have. So that's just an example. Environment really talks about the space and like how people interact with that space. So it can be things like crops and stuff. So we'll see this, for example, going forward with um, cotton and other stuff like that. Here's an example of uh, the spread of the disease uh, for uh, the bubonic plague. Um, you can see this kind of, I guess, like an orange. Um, that's the area where there, it initially comes in. And then if you look, you can see it's, it spreads along these trade networks, right? So we have Constantinople, then that's going to move into, uh, you know, Sicily and Genoa and Marseille and all these places that are heavy trading hubs because that's how this spread. And then from those trading hubs, that kind of green color, it's going to spread out into those areas because they're close to those trade hubs. So some of these areas that were not connected to the trade hub very much at all, such as that central Polish area, Area there, it says relatively unaffected. These folks just didn't really participate as much in international trade as some other places did. All right, lastly, but not unimportantly, we have the travelers. So there's three important travelers in this period. Uh, there is also this uh, Zhang Zhang guy who is uh, Tipitaka, who is the guy who brings Buddhism to China. That guy's mentioned in the book as well, but he's not as important as these other folks are. Um, so first off, we have Ibn Battuta. Um, this guy was a Muslim who traveled throughout the Muslim world, recorded his observations. That, for some reason, is the only picture you really get, that one up at the top. Whenever you look him up, he looks kind of weird, uh, <laughs> like angry. Um, but uh, hugely important because he wrote down or at least had others write down all of his observations so he's going all throughout the Muslim world and we have this today so we have this great snapshot of his life and like what it was like living in the Islamic world during his time period uh, we have all heard of Marco Polo and perhaps played his famous pool game uh, he traveled to Europe uh, excuse me traveled to China from Europe and recorded his journey um, one of the big impacts of this is that it led to Europeans seeking more trade with the East Lastly, we got Marguerite Kemp, uh, an English Christian mystic. She traveled to the Holy Land, recorded her trip in a book, um, and basically uh, let people know about things going on beyond the borders of Europe. So super important person uh, to change people's perspectives on that. That's her right here next to me. So. All right, uh, that's what we got here for 7.4 to to, uh, to 7. Again, a lot of this stuff is really going to be based around that Trans-Saharan trade, but also this kind of remix of things as well, like these travelers, these environmental consequences. These are some of the kind of categories that we use within AP World History. So um, be cognizant of those uh, as you're thinking about it. Um, this is the last of uh, Unit 2, so Unit 3 is coming up pretty darn soon. Y'all take care. Hope y'all are doing well. Bye-bye.